Welcome back to this space. And if you are visiting this channel for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the pelvic walls, but we would be focusing on the posterior pelvic wall. I've done a part one and part two lectures on the pelvic walls. If you've not checked those lectures, well, please kindly go and do so. Let's try and use this image by the side here for illustration. Let's say this is the pelvic cavity. And the wall that is created behind it, as shown in this image here that is harrowed in blue, is the posterior pelvic wall. So ride on with me as I unfold the structural component of the posterior pelvic wall. The pelvic cavity is seen to generally have five walls, Let's say this is where we have the pelvic cavity. And above this region here is where we have the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity is superiorly continuous with the pelvic cavity below. The pelvic cavity is seen to have the anterior wall, which of course is the wall that is created in the anterior part, just as the name implies. And we have the posterior wall behind. Then we have two lateral walls on both sides. Then finally, we have the inferior wall that is the inferior limit of the pelvic cavity. And this is also referred to as the pelvic floor. But for the purpose of this class, we would be focusing on the posterior pelvic wall. And this is what is harrowed here in this image. If you look at this image here that we used to represent the pelvic cavity, the wall that is created behind is the posterior wall. So let's drive in further to see the structural component of the posterior wall. The posterior wall of the pelvic cavity is seen to be formed by bones. So we have a number of bones around this region that is seen to form the posterior boundary of the pelvic wall. We also have muscles, of course, having their origin and their insertion point at this region. We also have joints created at the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. And finally, we have ligaments that are seen to help reinforce this joint. So let's drive it into each of these subcomponents. For the bony component of the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity, we have two bones forming the posterior alignment of the pelvic cavity. It is the anterior surfaces of these bones that are seen to form the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. So we have the sacrum. This is the sacrum here, harrowed in red. And if you go to the sacrum, we have the cossex. And this is the cossex that is also arrowed here in yellow. So we have these two bones forming the bony boundary of the posterior pelvic cavity. We also have muscles forming the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. And the major muscle that is seen at the posterior pelvic wall is the piriformis. We have indentation created on the lateral wall of the pelvic bone referred to as the acetabulum. The acetabulum is created to receive the head of the femur Let's say this is where we have the femur here at this point. And you see the head of the femur fixing into the acetabulum. And of course, this kind of presentation will also be seen on this side. So let's now drive into how the piriformis originates and also where it insects upon. It's establishing how it is now being positioned at the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. The piriformis is seen to originate from the anterior surface of the sacrum this is where we have the sacrum here. Remember in our previous slide where we tried to establish the different bones that form the posterior boundary or limit of the pelvic cavity. We try to list the sacrum as one of these bones. So you see the anterior surface of the sacrum creates the origination site for the piriformis muscle. So you see the piriformis originating at the anterior surface of the sacrum. And you see it parting through the greater sciatic foramen where it exits the pelvic cavity. And finally, you see the fibers of this muscle inserted on the greater trunk attack of the femur. And this is around the head region of the femur. And if you see the pattern by which it runs, you will see that it is seen to structurally form part of the component of the posterior pelvic wall. We also have other muscles around the space. These muscles are not seen as a whole to be placed around the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. And these muscles include the muscles of the pelvic floor. And this is attributed to the fact that the pelvic floor is dome-shaped. And because of this dome-shaped pattern that the pelvic floor forms, you see part of the muscles of the pelvic floor also extending to the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. 
Let's look at the procedures module. The procedures module is also referred to as the ischial procedures. This procedures module is located at the posterior part of the pelvic floor. If you try to use this image down here for illustration, this region that is harrowed at this point is where we have the pelvic floor. And of course, we know that the pelvic floor is structurally made up of the levator ani muscle and the coccygeus muscle. The coccygeus muscle is the most posteriorly placed muscle of all the muscles that are seen to form the pelvic floor. So if you have the coccygeus at the posterior part, if you try to go back to this image up here, we know that the coccygeus muscle is seen to originate from the ischial spine and of course, inserted onto the coccyx. And this is where the name ischiocosigeus is drafted from. So the ischiocosigeus muscle here is what is seen to be highlighted here in yellow. You have one on this side and you have one on the other side. You can see that this muscle is seen to originate from the spine of the ischio. And finally, you see it being inserted on the coccyx. And along this part that the fibers run, you see that it is also taking the space at the posterior part of the pelvic cavity. So you see this muscle also contributing to the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. We also have part of the levator ani muscle, and we've tried to attribute this to the doom shaped pattern of the pelvic floor. We know that the levator ani muscle is seen to contain the pubo rectalis, the pubo coccygeus, and also the ilio coccygeus. If you look at this pattern here that is created at this point, we say that the levator ani muscle forms the major structural component of the pelvic floor. And because of the doom shape appearance, it tends to extend to the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. So basically, we have two of this levator ani muscle. We have the pubo coccygeus and the ilio coccygeus. These two muscles, specifically, it is the posterior part of these two muscles that of course contribute to the alignment of the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. So it's good for us to be able to establish this. We know that generally, the levator ani muscle is seen to form the floor of the pelvic cavity. If you've not checked off my lecture on the pelvic floor, which of course is the inferior wall of the pelvic cavity, please kindly go and check off the lecture. We described or established in that lecture that the levator ani muscle runs a funnel-shaped appearance, which of course is like a dome. And if it does run this kind of configuration, it means that some of the fibers will also be seen at the posterior part. But of course, specifically, it is the posterior regions of the pubo procedures and also the iliocosidious muscle, which are part of the levator ani muscle that are seen to form the posterior pelvic wall. So it's good for us to be able to highlight this because of the dune shaped appearance of the pelvic floor. Some of its fibers are seen to contribute to the formation of the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. And of course, if you're driving deep into the name, the pubo procedures and also the ilia procedures, you see that the terminal part of this name is coccygeus, which means that they are finally inserted on the coccyx. And if they are inserted on the coccyx, remember going back to our previous slide, when we try to highlight this bony component of the posterior wall of the pelvic floor, coccyx is one of the structural components that is formed by bone at this region. So it means they will be inserted on the coccyx, which means that the posterior end of this muscle will be inserting on the coccyx. And this will be taking the space around the posterior wall of the pelvic floor. So it's good for us to be able to establish and also understand the basis behind listing this muscle as part of the structural component of the posterior pelvic wall. But of course, it is specifically the posterior regions of this muscle. So let's drive further to see the joints that are created at the posterior wall. It's also seen with a number of joints. And one of which is the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joints are two in number. We have one on the right side and we have another one on the left. If you try to break down the name, as I've always said on this channel, you would know the point where these joints are created and also the structures that are involved. For the sacroiliac joint, it means that this joint connects the sacrum, which is at this region, with the ilium, which is on this other side. So you see the joint created between the sacrum and also the ilium. The ilium is one of the structural components of the pelvic bone. And this is where we have this joint created. In classifying this joint, we say that this joint is a synovial type of joint 
which means that it has synovia apparatus embedded within it. It is also a diatrodial type of joint, which means that it freely exhibits movement. Then the second type of joint is the sacrococcygeal joint. The sacrococcygeal joint, how we still need to do is to break down the name. This is where we have the sacrococcygeal joint here, Harold, at this point. It means the joint that is created between the sacrum and also the cossex. And in trying to classify this joint, we say it is a cartilaginous joint. It is specifically a secondary cartilaginous joint. It is a same thesis also because it is located along the midline plane. Cartilaginous joints that are located along the midline plane are classified as symphysis. It is an amphiatrodial type of joint because it exhibits slight movement. So it's important for us to be able to classify this joint also, apart from establishing the region where they are formed. Then the next structural component of the posterior pelvic wall are ligaments. These ligaments are basically seen to reinforce the joint. So you see them running across the joint that we have listed in our previous slide. And the first ligament is the anterior sacroiliac ligament. Anterior because it is in the anterior part, and sacroiliac because it is a ligament that reinforces the sacroiliac joint. And this is what is heard here in white. If you go back to our previous slide, remember we tried to establish the sacroiliac joint as one of the joints created at the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. And this joint is further reinforced by the anterior sacroiliac ligament. For the fact that we have anterior sacroiliac ligament, as I have always said in class, we'll definitely be having a posterior sacroiliac ligament. And this will be positioned behind this joint. But for the posterior pelvic wall, the structure that is formed around the space is the anterior sacroiliac ligament because it is the ligament that reinforces this joint in the anterior part. And because we are focusing on the posterior pelvic cavity, so it's good for us to be able to explain and understand what this means. Then the second ligament is the anterior longitudinal ligament. This is the anterior longitudinal ligament here, Harold in red. The anterior longitudinal ligament are seen to run from the cervical region down to the sacrum. And of course, they are seen to run along the anterior border or region of the vertebral column. This ligament is seen to help reinforce or support this joint in the anterior part. We know that the vertebral column are small pieces of bones that are arranged one on top of each other. And of course, they need to be supported and guided. So we have the anterior longitudinal ligament running across the vertebral column in the anterior part. And of course, this ligament is also seen at the pelvic region. And this is why it is taken as part of the structural component of the posterior pelvic wall. The next ligament is the anterior sacrococcygeal ligament. This is the anterior sacrococcygeal ligament here, Harold in black. This is more or less like a continuation of the anterior longitudinal ligament. But you see it specifically reinforcing the sacrococcygeal joint at this point. Remember, we also described the sacrococcygeal joint in our previous slide. We're trying to highlight the joint of the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. So you see the anterior sacrococcygeal ligament here at the front reinforcing this joint and it's taken as part of the structural component of the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. Then the next ligament is the sacrospinous ligament. The sacrospinous ligament is not the whole of this ligament that is seen at the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity, but we have the posterior region of this ligament. This is where we have the sacrospinous ligament here, Harold in blue. This ligament is seen to connect the spine of the ischium this is where we have the spine of the ischium to the sacrum. So you see it running along this part. It is not just running along this part. This ligament is seen to transform the greater sciatic notch into the greater sciatic foramen. So you see it converting this notch here at this upper part into a foramen. Of course, creating pathway for structures to run through. So you see the sacrospinous ligament here, Harold in blue. But specifically, it is the posterior region of this ligament that is seen at the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. We also have the sacrotuberous ligament. This is the sacrotuberous ligament here, also arrowed at this point. This sacrotuberous ligament also has the same orientation as the sacrospinous ligament. It is just that they are connected at different points. So if you try to break down the sacrotuberous, we try to break down the name, you see that this ligament connects the tuberosity of the ischium down here 
to the sacrum. So this is how it runs. And this is not just running along this course. This ligament is also helping to transform the lesser sciatic notch into the lesser sciatic foramen, just as what is presented by the sacrospinous ligament that is already in blue. So you see these two ligaments transforming the greater and the lesser sciatic notches into foramina. But it's good for us to understand that it is the posterior region of these two ligaments that has seen to contribute to the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. So thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glued to this channel.